Uh, good morning. Thank you uh, for joining us. Just wanted to uh, give a, a quick update on um, on my uh, just completed trip to Japan, uh, and then I'll be willing to and able to take any questions that you might have. Um, in while in Okinawa, I was able to attend the uh, International en Energy Symposium uh, and met with government and business officials uh, in Okinawa. Uh, the focus really was about the state of Hawaii and the Okinawa Prefecture Memorandum of Cooperation on Clean and Efficient Energy Development and Deployment. Again, we uh, are excited about the opportunities uh, to work with the Prefecture of Okinawa. Uh, as you may recall, last year I traveled to Okinawa to celebrate the 30th anniversary of a sister state relationship with Okinawa Prefecture. Uh, and as part of that, we uh, entered this uh, memor memorandum of cooperation. Um, you know, there are many similarities between uh, Okinawa and uh, Hawaii. Um, it's about the same population, 1.4 million people. Um, they are very dependent on uh, fossil fuels, imported fossil fuels, and uh, we are working together. I was able to travel to Kumajima island to visit their, the uh, ocean thermal energy conversion facility uh, in Okinawa uh, and visited their ocean development park which was modeled after our uh, natural energy lab on the big island to see their progress um, in uh, aquaculture and using uh, deep uh, ocean seawater for a variety of products. Um, you know, they are really big on a couple things. Um, clearly, they see uh, OTEC as a viable renewable energy source for many of their islands. Okinawa has about 50 uh, islands um, that, that uh, a good number of them are inhabited with uh, relatively small populations, and OTEC is a, a perfect technology for that. Uh, Kumajima Island, for example, is um, about the size of Molokai, and it has a population of about uh, 8,000 people. Uh, and so that kind of energy load uh, is perfect for OTEC. And uh, a reminder, OTEC is a firm power um, that does not, is not um, susceptible to the rising of the sun uh, or um, wind energy. Uh, also looked at a sea grapes operation um, they really are promoting that as a, a viable aquaculture crop in Okinawa. Uh, I, more importantly, in Japan, uh, they call it um, green caviar. They are pos positioning it as a, a gourmet-type uh, project. They call it caviar of the ocean. Um, you know, we were able to visit that operation, and certainly there's a, um, an opportunity to um, to develop sea grapes here in the state of Hawaii. Uh, so again, we're focused on uh, extending that collaboration. Uh, while in Okinawa, I uh, attended a number of activities associated with the sixth worldwide Uchinanchu Festival, uh, which uh, occurs in Okinawa every five years. It's uh, their effort to build the uh, Okinawan network of uh, expatriates around the world. There were more than 7,000 people who returned of Okinawan descent that returned to Okinawa to participate in the festival. Uh, they are now in 28 different countries. Uh, there were more than 1,800 um, people from Hawaii of Okinawan descent that returned to Okinawa as part of this festival. So clearly, a very significant por uh, portion of the pr participants came from Hawaii. Um, so it was a great opportunity to uh, celebrate being from Okinawa and really talking about um, the cultural business uh, and educational successes of uh, those of Okinawan descent. And uh, as the first uh, governor in the United States of Okinawan descent, I definitely was proud to be able to participate uh, in the activities uh, and share in the celebration of, um, of Okinawa and of, of being Okinawan. Uh, from Okinawa, we went on to Tokyo uh, and had a number of meetings uh, in Tokyo. 
uh, able to meet with the chief executive officer of uh, All Nippon Airways, ANA. Uh, as you may know, the, my last visit uh, to Japan, they were in the process of their uh, strategic planning, and I had um, suggested that Hawaii be a big part of their uh, plans. Uh, and a year later, they are executing a plan to significantly increase air seats to Hawaii. Um, they uh, have committed to uh, purchasing and deploying to the Hawaii routes the Airbus 380 uh, that we are working uh, at the airports division at, um, at Honolulu International Airport to be able to accommodate um, that aircraft. Um, it is, uh, as you may know, the Airbus 380 can accommodate up to 500 passengers on a single flight. Uh, and uh, ANA is really uh, committed to expanding seats to Hawaii, uh, which uh, has a significant impact on our, our visitor um, income. Japanese visitors spend $3.7 billion a year in Hawaii. That, that averages about $10 million a day. Uh, that, that's equivalent to $1 million in tax revenue uh, in GAT and TAT uh, each and every day. Uh, we also had the chance to meet with uh, Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs to discuss a number of issues. Uh, most prominent is pre-clearance uh, at Narita Airport. Um, I do believe that getting um, an airport in Asia pre-cleared um, for sending guests to Hawaii would have significant impact. Um, as you may be aware, uh, the Western Governors Association, um, on a resolution initiated by me, uh, embraced the notion of preclearance from Asia airports. I think all of the Western states understand um, what uh, significant improvement uh, preclearance uh, would have on international travel to uh, Hawaii and the rest of the United States. Uh, so uh, that meeting went uh, very well. Uh, we we had the opportunity, or I had the opportunity also to meet with the Hawaii-Japan uh, uh, Legislative Friendship Association. Uh, as you know, the Hawaii-Japan uh, connection is fundamentally important to the United States of America. And Hawaii is the only state that has a relationship with the Diet, both the House of Counselors and the House of Representatives. Uh, to really further uh, business education, cultural exchanges uh, between Hawaii and Japan. Uh, and again, in those meetings, we talked about preclearance and the importance of preclearance uh, to Hawaii. And, and I, I believe there is a business case to be made uh, in Japan as well. Um, and we talked about uh, Kona Airport. As you uh, are aware, it's been a priority of mine to reestablish uh, Kona Airport as an international point of entry. Uh, we have Customs and Border Patrol personnel in Hawaii just yesterday uh, running through the final checklist of what we would need to get uh, Kona Airport uh, certified for international travel. And uh, you are aware that Hawaiian Airlines has a, approved a, um, a route from Haneda Airport to Kona uh, in international uh, to, so that we would be able to uh, receive direct flights um, from Japan into or any other uh, international point of origin into Kona Airport. Um, you know, Honolulu is the fourth busiest point of international entry into the United States of America. Uh, and uh, we are committed to expanding uh, access because it is such an important part of our economy. Uh, Kona going to international status would really help uh, guests getting to um, neighbor islands and, and the big islands specifically. Um, we also, I also had the opportunity to meet with Customs and Border Patrol officials in the U.S. Uh, Embassy in uh, Japan, Tokyo, to talk about preclearance. Uh, they understand why it's important to the state of Hawaii that we move forward uh, with preclearance, and they are committed uh, to 
approving preclearance from Narita Airport. They had just come from a meeting with uh, officials at Narita Airport to talk about the requirements uh, of uh, implementing preclearance. Uh, and it was uh, very good to hear from Customs and Border Patrol that they, they do view uh, the opportunity at Narita different than they uh, have uh, in other jurisdictions, and they are working uh, with the state of Hawaii and um, and the Narita Airport uh, officials to uh, to be creative and flexible in how they will implement uh, preclearance at Narita Airport. Um, so all in all, it was a very productive trip. Um, you know, we uh, made progress in a number of areas and continue to stress. Um, with the government and business officials about why um, the relationship between Japan and Hawaii is so important. Uh, and with that, I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions specifically about the trip uh, or take other questions at the end. On, on the, this uh, aircraft that we're about to Right, it's, uh, it, it requires uh, a, a double-decker uh, dual uh, gates. Uh, Ford has presented to the airport's uh, committee here yesterday about what that investment would be. It's about uh, $30 million at Honolulu International Airport. Uh, ANA would be making an uh, additional investment in to renovate space um, that they would use to receive the visitors uh, off of their uh, aircraft. You know, ANA is really committed as part of their commitment and investment to this route of creating a new class of traveler uh, to Hawaii, uh, kind of a, a, a super first class that would um, have different status. You know, they really believe that um, this will be one of their signature routes um, between uh, Japan and, and Hawaii. Yes, they have committed last year when I visited with them, uh, they had committed to double the, the number of seats uh, coming to Hawaii and they would do it in phases and stages. The first is actually being implemented right now. They are upgrading to the, the larger Boeing uh, aircraft that would allow them to increase uh, seat capacity incrementally now. And then when they receive the Airbus 380s, then they would uh, add that to the mix. No, I mean, they had, we had discussed that specifically last year that they um, were interested in exploring that. Obviously, Honolulu International Airport today cannot accommodate um, that 380. So we've had a number of uh, meetings, both with Airbus as a manufacturer to understand what the airport requirements are, and then uh, with the ANA officials. So we are working very closely um, with uh, ANA to uh, fully understand what their requirements and their timeline. They hope to have an all 380 fleet to Hawaii in 2019. And so we're working to meet those requirements. They are actually also interested in flying the 380 to Kona uh, International, which um, will be a challenge. But, but we are committed, you know, we are excited that um, that ANA and Japan Airlines and other carriers from uh, international points are interested in uh, serving Kona Airport um, and serving Hawaii more importantly. Uh, and we will continue to make investments to improve the, the um, airports in our state to receive them. No, so well, it's a it's couple things, it, and it's really not just for ANA. It really would service any airline that would want to fly the 380 into uh, Hawaii. So the airports division have evaluated uh, Honolulu Airport specifically to identify which would be uh, make the most sense in terms of uh, where to provide access for the 380. So I think tentatively right now they've identified uh, gate 34 and gate 29 
as the best opportunity to um, to provide for the Airbus 380. And so the, the investment really is to uh, invest in Honolulu to receive the 380. Um, specifically, ANA is committed to doing that. Um, I'm certain that once that capacity is at the airport, then other airlines would also consider. Um, how about the OTEX? At what point would it become cost effective? We do believe, and that part of the conversations on this trip was about at what point does it become cost effective. They do believe that a one megawatt facility would be able to pro um, prove commercial viability of a larger scale uh, generation facility. So the conversation and discussion was really about getting to that next step of how we can work together to build a one megawatt um, facility. And they believe that, um, that what they would probably look at deploying as, as commercial uh, plants would be five to ten megawatt facilities. Because the argument always used here has been it would have to be a hundred megawatt to be cost effective. Yeah, no, the um, the conversation, I, I, uh, Henry, I don't know what conversations happened before. They do believe that they can prove uh, economic viability at one megawatt. So that's that's the conversation. And you know, one megawatt is significant. So we would Well, we are working together. Obviously, we both have an interest in determining the commercial viability of OTEC. Um, and so the part of the conversation was what site in Okinawa would make the most sense, what site in Hawaii would make the most sense for a one megawatt facility. Uh, and then we are both trying to calculate what the cost of uh, that would be and then see how we would collaborate. You know, on our side, we uh, have a partnership with the uh, U.S. Department of Energy that we've been talking to, and um, you know, and we would be looking for uh, federal partners to come up with at least a portion of the cost. You know, what the state would come up with, and on the Japan side, they've been talking with um, um, the the Japanese government energy uh, offices as well as the Okinawan government. So it's really trying to put together that consortium to fund that one megawatt facility. And the decision of whether it's in Hawaii or in Okinawa, I think, would be determined by um, where the bulk of the funds come from. Regarding Kona Airport, when and can we, can we see that coming? We hope to get it certified by the end of this month. And we hope that the first uh, international flights would begin in, in December. So we are talking very, very soon. Customs and Border Patrol was in uh, last week. Uh, and we do hope to have the final inspectors in uh, the week after next, I believe, for the final punch list of, um, of, of approvals. What changes will people see at that airport in terms of how they get through? Well, it wouldn't uh, impact um, the majority of people. The only uh, people who would be impacted are international arrivals. Uh, and so the international flights would uh, go through uh, what we're calling the temporary um, um, customs facility for uh, going through uh, and being received. So as you, I don't know how familiar you are with Kona Airport, but there was a temporary facility that was operated there out of a kind of a, a tent structure that we are refurbishing and cleaning up and getting certified. Uh, as you know, we've been promoting a permanent uh, international terminal at Kona Airport for the last two sessions and we will be back to ask for that, so. That's the Hawaiian? Yes, Hawaiian Airlines is, uh, has been approved for a Haneda, Haneda, right, Mike? Yeah, Haneda to Kona route. Uh, I do know, and I personally received other interest from other uh, Japanese as well as Korean carriers um, to, to fly into Kona if we can get it approved. You know, and it probably would start as charters, I mean, um, Hawaiian is the f first scheduled route. Um, I know that there's other interests and it would probably begin as charters. Uh, and then as they build the interest, then it would probably be converted to additional uh, scheduled flights.
No, we haven't. No, I mean, I think, and we've had uh, discussions with the Bureau of Ocean Management um, and, and got an update on what their process is. You know, they are formulating how they intend to proceed. As you know, there are uh, lots of concerns um, with the Navy, you know, and they've, uh, they've gone through and they've met with a number of uh, interest groups uh, in Hawaii to, to understand better. Uh, so we just look forward to the next step. You know, when I uh, talked with the director of the office, she said, you know, it's five to ten years off. I mean, the, the processes that are required for it to to continue is a long, long process. But if the federal government said, we think it's acceptable, and they could lease it out without you really having anything to say about it, right? That is correct. That uh, it's, it's a federal uh, requirement. I suppose that it would require some kind of purchase agreement with uh, the utilities, right? Because it doesn't help to generate the electricity if they can't sell it anywhere. And so there would be a requirement um, that would come before the PUC at some point would be, be my guess. Um, but I mean, you know, just in discussion with um, the federal people, I mean, I don't think they are interested in uh, doing something that the community doesn't support in Hawaii. I mean, they were here specifically to get input. I know that they had asked uh, for a list of um, uh, organizations and, and people that they should be meeting with, and we've uh, shared um, suggestions. And I think they pretty much followed up and met with uh, all of the organizations and uh, um, people that we've suggested. So, you know, they, I would say this is very preliminary in the process. They are uh, trying to determine what the next step would be.